All right, you got your Bibles or smartphones, tablets, something. You got something. All right, all right. If you have a printed Bible, can you hold it up? Let me see the printed Bible folk in the house. Praise God. Oh, we got some books. That's what I'm talking about. All right. All my mobile natives, all right, digital natives, raise up, raise it up, raise it up, all right. Got some digital natives, praise God. Place, because of Jesus, we can have print and digital, praise God. So uh, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. That's going to be our focal passage. Today, again, we're talking about freedom through boundaries, freedom through boundaries. So imagine what it would be like uh, to have been in some form of bondage, uh, to be in some form of slavery, some form of not being able to do what you want, when you want, how you want. And then for you to be set free, but not know that you are free. So you've been in it, something occurs that allows you to be set free but you don't discover that you are free until some time later. Uh, that's the story of, of what many of us know of with Juneteenth, uh, that there were a number of African Americans within this community, uh, within this country, uh, specifically in Texas, who had been declared free, but didn't know they were free for another almost two years. So they were continuing to function in bondage without the awareness and the knowledge that they were free. Can you imagine how liberated they felt when that message of freedom finally arrived on their doorstep? When they were finally told that we really are free and now we can move in the direction of living out our freedom? I imagine that they were not just elated, but I imagine they were overjoyed to discover that they were free. I wonder, similarly, how many of us operate on a daily, weekly, monthly basis as though we're still in bondage? When there was an announcement over 2,000 years ago <laughs> that in Jesus Christ, freedom is available. I wonder how many of us, even though we've heard people allude to it, the message of freedom has not yet stuck, took root in our heads and our hearts to alert us to the fact, not just the fact, but to help us to embrace the reality that we really are free. Here is the message of Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, depending on the translation you read. Some translations say, for freedom Christ has set us free, right? For freedom Christ has set us free. Therefore, stand firm in your freedom and don't allow someone, don't allow yourselves to be put back in bondage. Don't allow yourselves to be put back in slavery. Don't allow yourselves to be ensnared, to be entrapped yet again with the yoke of bondage, depending on the translation. It's this declaration of freedom that goes forth and then the reminder to stand firm in it and then the reminder, literally a command to stand firm and then literally a command to not allow yourselves to be dragged back in to bondage. The book of Galatians is written to a group of Christians uh, who were not Jewish, so they didn't grow up with the understanding of the law, didn't grow up uh, as a part of the nation of Israel, but they were communicated the good news of Jesus Christ, that in Jesus Christ all of humanity could have a relationship with God through him, through faith in Jesus, all of humanity could have a relationship with God, and they received that message with joy. Not only did they receive that message with joy, but their lives changed because of that message. They begin to walk out that message. I mean, man, they, they were transformed because of the good news of the message of Jesus Christ, available to people who were not a part of the nation of Israel, to people who were non-Jews. They now have received the gospel, and they were living it out. And then after a few years of living it out, 
there were some people who came into their midst, into their community. They were called Judaizers. Can somebody say Judaizers? I know it was a mouthful. Let's try it again. Say Judaizers. Right? So there were some people who came into their midst. They were called Judaizers. And, and when they came into their midst, here is what they did. They were people, the Judaizers were of the nation of Israel. They were raised in the law, raised in the ceremonial teachings, all of that related to the nation of Israel. And when they came into the midst of this new community of faith with all these new believers who didn't have a background as far as being connected to the nation of Israel, who just received the good news of the gospel by faith in Jesus Christ. No law, no rules, none of that, no rituals or none of that. When the Judaizers came into the environment, here's what they said to these new Christians. They said, y'all not really Christian. Y'all pretend Christian. If you want to be really Christian, then you have to obey all the law. Until you obey all the law, you will pretend Christian. You're not really in relationship with God. Until you follow the, the ceremonial rules and, and the moral teachings that we grew up with as a nation and learn, then you're not really in relationship with God. You got to follow the rules and the rituals and the rites if you want to really be in relationship with God. Can you imagine how confusing that was? So Paul writes to these Christians to say, hey, I'm shocked that you all have so easily, Pastor Copeland's word, been hoodwinked, right? I'm shocked that you all have so easily been turned away from the true gospel that relationship with God is through faith in Jesus Christ and nothing else. I'm surprised that you all have allowed other people to come into your midst with another version of the gospel that is not really the gospel. I am surprised that after being joy-filled, after being transformed, after being changed, after seeing your families restored and reconciled, after experiencing dramatic life change in your community, I am surprised that you all have allowed these people to come in with this fake gospel and convince you that you got to do Jesus plus a whole bunch of other stuff in order for you to be right with God. Paul says, this is foolishness. So by the time he gets to Galatians chapter 5, he just makes this simple statement. For freedom, Christ has made you free. May I just say, I wonder how many of us have been hoodwinked, convinced, maybe subtly and unintentionally, that if we don't have Jesus plus, we're not really a child of God. That if we don't have Jesus plus, and I need to go to church, 42 weeks out of the year, then I'm really not a child of God. Jesus plus, oh, I, I have to have not just a Bible, but a certain translation of the Bible in order for me to really be a child of God. Jesus plus, oh, I, I, I need to have Jesus and I need to live to check out all these boxes. And if I miss a box, I am really not a child of God. I wonder how many of us, maybe not verbally, but maybe in our practice, respond to God in such a way where we say, God, I know, I know, I'm trying. I know I'm not really one of yours, but I'm working on it. I hope I get there before I die. I wonder how many of us have been subtly convinced that Christ has not set us free. So, can I make Paul's statement? If you place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you place your faith, your confidence, you rest upon, believe in not just intellectually, but you have, you've seated your life in the truth, that Jesus, the Son of God, came into this world, 
that he laid down his life and shed his blood to pay your sin debt, my sin debt, and the sin debt of the world, that the father was satisfied with his payment, that he didn't just die, but just like he said, he rose on the third day triumphantly and victoriously, that he didn't just get up, but he walked around on earth for a while, and then he stepped on a cloud and ascended back into heaven with his Father, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, still fully God and fully man, right? And that only through faith in him do you have relationship with God. If you have believed that, please know on today, Jesus says you are free. <laughs> I know, I know it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. It's like, Jesus, I just don't feel like that's enough. It seems like it's too easy that you've done it all. See, see what, what, what the, the Christians at Galatia were, were being told is that you need Jesus and you got to keep the law. And if you don't keep the law, then you're going to miss the mark. Paul says, now I want you to know that for freedom, Christ has set you free. That, that, that Christ has liberated you. That he's liberated you from, from the weight of having to check all the boxes of the law. Because if you're going to go by the law, you got to fulfill the whole law, not just part of it. If you're going to be in relationship with God and get in according to the law, nobody could meet the standard of the law because you got to do everything in the law and not just some of the things in the law, right? So, but when we understand that Christ has set us free from earning a relationship with God, Paul speaks to us and says, for freedom, Christ has set you free. So what we want to talk about today is, as free people, how boundaries can help us walk in our freedom. That's what we want to talk about. So, because I don't know if we all believe it yet, if you have trusted, how many of you trust in Jesus Christ? He's your Lord, your Savior, your follower of Jesus, all right? Okay, all right. So can you just say, I'm free? Come on, say it like you believe it. Just say, I'm free. I'm free. All right? And one more time. Just say, I'm free. I'm free. All right. So, so since we're free, let's talk about how boundaries can help us to walk in our freedom. Boundaries help us walk in our freedom because boundaries help us to be who we are in Jesus. They help us to live out who we are in Jesus. What do you mean by that? He begins by saying, for freedom Christ has set us free. Here, here's the essence of it. Real freedom isn't about living up to someone else's standards. It's about living true to who you are in Jesus. So go with me. We're in Galatians. I quoted Galatians 5. I want to read a little bit. Galatians 3.26, a part of it says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. And then in Galatians 4, 4 through 6, listen to what it says. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then you are an heir through God. Boundaries help to remind us who we are in Christ. So we set boundaries to remind us. We set boundaries to remind us that in the freedom that we have in Christ, we are free from performance. Can somebody say I'm free from performance? What does that mean? We're free from performance. That means that I don't have to prove or earn my way into relationship with God. I don't have to prove or earn my way into relationship with God. Why? Because Galatians 4, 4 through 6 says, when I place my faith, my hope, my confidence in Jesus Christ, God says that I am a son or a daughter. Not just a son or a daughter, but God says that I am an heir. So when I place my faith, my hope, my confidence in Jesus Christ, I become a child of God. 
And because I am a child of God, God is my daddy. I can call him Abba Father. That's where we get, we, we make the reference of daddy, right? I can call him Abba Father. And because he is my daddy and I can call him Abba Father, I don't have to perform to be in the family. It may work like that in your family, but it don't work like that in God's family, right? In some families, if you don't act a certain way, if you don't do certain things, they kick you out of the family. But in God's family, God said, if you're my son and my daughter, you're my son and my daughter. You're my son and my daughter on your good day. You're my son and my daughter on your worst day. you still my son and my daughter. I don't care what you do. I say, yeah, that's my baby. That's my baby. That's, I know my baby acting a fool, but that's my baby. That's my baby. I know that's my boy. That's my boy. He tripping today, but that's still my boy. I don't have to perform my way into the family. Why? Because once I place my faith, my hope, my confidence in Jesus Christ, God adopted me into his family. He included me. He calls me his child, and I get to call him my daddy. So what am I trying to say? We set up boundaries to remind it. Every time I find myself trying to perform, trying to earn my way, trying to prove that I'm good enough to be in the family of God for a whole bunch of reasons, I need to set up boundaries to remind me, no, I'm already a child of God. What are you doing? I'm, all, I'm already accepted in the family of God. He's already my daddy. He can't be more of my daddy than he already is. He already all my daddy. And because he's my daddy, then I set up boundaries to remind me that, that I have a freedom from performance. Not only a freedom from performance, but it's a reminder that our relationship with God is not transactional. It's relational. Many of us in our relationships... Our relationships are transactional. Don't say anything too loud because people might notice you. But some of us in relationships with people, if you act right, we treat you a certain way. You don't act right, we treat you a certain way. Right? It's transactional. I respond to you based on how you respond to me. If you good to me, I'll be good to you. You crazy with me, I'll be crazy with you, right? It's, 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 right? it's an exchange, right? It's tit for tat, right? Our relationship with God is not tit for tat. He loved us while we were still enemies. He loved us while we were ungodly. He, he loved us while we were still messed up. God loves us with an unconditional love. It's not tit for tat. God loved us while we were at our worst. He did what he did for us while we were at our worst. He can't love us no more now. He loves us the same. It's not a transactional relationship. God did all the work because God decided in advance that he loves us. And through faith in Jesus Christ, he receives us. So when I when I understand it, I'm free, then I establish boundaries to make sure that I don't, I don't get caught up in trying to perform for my daddy because I don't have to perform to get my daddy's pleasure. My daddy already loves me. I, I don't, <laughs> daddies, we got to do better, especially when we have children who engage in sports, right? I don't, I don't have to be the superstar in order for my daddy or mama to show up. They show up because they my daddy and my mama. If I don't do anything other than wear the uniform, they give me a big old hug afterward. Why? Because I'm still their child and they my daddy and my mama. Right? See, that's why it's hard for us to receive it because we don't respond with others like that. And we don't oftentimes respond with our children and our parents didn't respond with us like that, right? So we're like, oh, I'm just going to receive this unconditional love from God. Right? So I put in boundaries because... I want to make sure that I have things in place to remind me that I don't need to perform for God. But also, boundaries help us to, to walk in our freedom, not just freedom from performance, but freedom from anxiety. Can you imagine the weight and the pressure of constantly feeling like if you don't get it just right, you won't be accepted? Can you imagine that weight of of, 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 of of, of, of if you don't have a perfect day, that somehow your daddy going to turn his back on you? Can you imagine that weight? And how many of us sometimes interact with God like that? Well, how your prayer life? Well, I haven't prayed in a while. Why haven't you prayed in a while? Well, you know, I just know I've been doing some stuff. And because I've been doing some stuff, I just, you know, I just, I just felt like maybe God don't want to hear me. 
here's, here's what I felt like because of what I was doing, God turned his back on me. Jesus says, no, for freedom I have set you free. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I love the story of the prodigal son. When the prodigal son has done all the dirt he can do, and then come to himself because he remembers the goodness of his daddy. When he comes back to his daddy's house, I love the way Jesus tells the story. His daddy is waiting for him, looking for him, and his daddy runs to him. Please know we have the kind of God who does not turn his back on us. He will not leave us. He will not forsake us. He is constantly looking for us and standing with open arms to receive us to say, I know, I know, I know. It's all good. We're going to throw a party for you. That's the kind of God we serve. So I need to put boundaries in place, put some things in action, because sometimes I allow the pressure and the thoughts of God may turn on me to cause me to turn on him. So I put things in place where when I'm, when I'm around people, who be like, God ain't hearing your prayer the way you living. You know what? God bless you. That's all I got. God bless you. I don't receive that because that's not the God I read about. I don't receive that. I don't receive that. God bless you. Bless you. All right. I see I need to exit right now. I'm looking for the exit. I need to exit right now, right, because you're talking foolishness, Right? So boundaries help us to walk out our freedom in Christ. Also, here's what we learn. Boundaries keep us solid in our freedom. In a culture where everything and everyone is hustling and grinding and trying to make their mark, it's easy to get caught up in the hype of what other people are saying and lose sight of who we are in Jesus. Jesus says, stand firm in your freedom. Stand firm in who he's made you to be. Set, set boundaries to keep you grounded. Set boundaries to, to remind us of who we are. You see, boundaries help us, help us stay true to ourselves. What do you mean? Uh, well, he says, for freedom Christ has, has set you free, so stand firm in it. Be anchored in it. Set, set some things in place to help you stay true to who you are in Jesus. Can we be honest? Sometimes I deviate from who I am in Jesus. So I need to set some boundaries. I need to put some things in place to help me be true to who I am in Jesus. Well, y'all, y'all looking at me like, like y'all don't have that problem. So uh, let's, just, let's just talk about it, right? So when, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm trying to stay true to who I am in Jesus, then I'm, I'm trying to make sure that, that as I live my life and I walk out my life, that I'm walking out my life in a way that reflects I am free in Christ. Now, here's what he says. So in Galatians chapter 5, you're still there. Galatians chapter 5, here's what he talks about. He talks about the fact that if we're going to walk this out, then we have to understand that there's a dynamic at place. Here's the dynamic that, at, that is at place, that, that oftentimes, even though Christ has, has made me free, I get to choose whether I walk in my freedom or not walk in my freedom. And I, I can see whether or not I'm walking in my freedom by the results. What do you mean I can see whether I'm walking in my freedom by the results? So the message translation of Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 13, listen to what it says. It's absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence, love others as you love yourself. That's uh, an act of true freedom. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out. In no time at all, you'll be annihilating each other and where will your precious freedom be then? My counsel is this, live freely animated and motivated by God's Spirit. Then you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness, for there is a root of sinful self-interest in us 
that is at odds with the free, free spirit, just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness. These two ways of life are contrary to each other so that you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. Why don't you choose to be led by the spirit and so escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence? It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. I could go on. This isn't the first time I've warned you. You know, if you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchid. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies widely. Legalism is helpless in bringing this about. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good, crucified. Now, some of you have New, new Living Translation, New King Translation. Here's what you remember. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then he goes into the fruit of the spirit is this, the fruit of the flesh is this. Here, here's what he's saying. We get to vote on how we live. Um, some of you don't remember, but Flip Wilson said, the devil made me do it. <laughs> That's an old quote. The devil didn't make you do it. I chose to do it. I get to choose, do I walk in my freedom by surrendering to this supernatural power called the Holy Spirit that God has placed on the inside of me, or do I walk in my flesh and do what I want to do? I get to choose. It might be a quick choice, but I get to choose. And, and here's the essence of it. All of us know when we walk in our flesh, it doesn't end up well. Have I got a witness in the house? You can just wave your toe. It doesn't end up well, right? We walk. So, so here's the thing. I get to choose, and it's a constant choice. Holy Spirit, will you help me? Help me, help me, help me, help me. I know I'm selfish. I know I'm selfish. I don't want to be selfish in this moment. Can you help me not to be selfish in this moment? Please help me. Holy Spirit, can you bright on my tongue? Can you bright on my tongue? Bright on my tongue. I know, I know, I know. I want to tear down, but you want me to build up. I know, I know, I know. Can you help me to build up instead of tear down? My first thought. Second thought, third thought, fifth thought, fifteenth thought was to tear down. But can you help me sixteenth thought to build up? Holy Spirit, I want to, I, I, so it's, it's being able to set up this awareness that each moment I get to choose how I'm going to live. And I get to take responsibility for my choices. This is an aside. Can we stop blaming other folk for our choices? It's an aside, right? It's an aside. If you wouldn't have, then I wouldn't have. Wait, wait, wait. I don't want to give you control because then I place myself back in bondage. If I say, because of what you did, I did such and such, then I'm saying, now you got power over me. But Christ has set me free. And because Christ has set me free, it doesn't make sense to me to give you power over me. I want Christ to have power over me. So I, I won't blame you for the choice I made. You did what you did, and then I chose to do what I did. It's not your fault. I made a choice. So setting up boundaries to say, God, help me make the choice. So sometimes with boundaries, it's, you know what? Now is not a good time for me to have this conversation. Can you give me an opportunity to talk with God 
to pray, read some word, and then can we reschedule this conversation? Because I really do want to honor Christ. Right? It's just being honest. Right? And let's be honest, sometimes you just jump into it. Well, once you're aware, you slipped into it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I jumped in the flesh. I got to kill that old flesh. So I'm sorry. I jumped in the flesh. Pause. Time out. Time out. Do this. Time out. Now, when you catch yourself this week operating in the flesh, even if nobody else knows what you're doing, do this for you. Just be like, whoo, Jesus. Time out. I need to go get it together so I can make the choice to walk in the spirit. (laughs) He says, stand firm. Because once we make the choice to walk in the spirit, then here's what happens. We allow the freedom that we have in Christ to shine through. People start to say stuff like, you know what? Not an old you. The old you. Oh, you would have let them have it. I just kept looking. I was like, okay, I know, I know they're going to say something. I know. Oh, I'm waiting. I, I got my popcorn. I pulled up my seat. I was like, whoo it's about to be on. And you just let it pass. You say, I'm trying to be better. Come on. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be better. Lest I hold you too long, let me jump to my last point. Here's my last point. He says, not only stand firm, but then he says, don't allow yourselves to be ensnared or to take on again the yoke of bondage. So here's where boundaries really become helpful. Because boundaries help me avoid traps of the past. So... um, uh, here's one of the things I, I strongly encourage. There's some gamers. Any gamers in the room? Gamers? Gamers? You play video games. Gamers, right? Or people who play chess, right? People who play chess in the room. Checkers. Uh, space players in the room. Space player. You ain't got to be saying space. Beard whiz. I know there's some beard whiz players in here, right? Okay. So when you play those kind of games, especially if you, if you play other people, then one of the things that you try to pay attention to is you try to pay attention to people's patterns and habits, right? Because as you study their patterns and their habits, if you begin to understand them, it gives you an advantage because you're anticipating how they're going to play and you counter how they're going to play because you paid attention to their patterns and their habits. Anybody ever done that? Right? In, in what you do? All right. Now, here, here, here's the thing I'm basically saying. Set up boundaries, understanding that you have patterns and habits. Pay attention to your own patterns and habits so that we can avoid familiar traps. Come on, somebody. Right? (laughs) See, if I know my patterns and my habits, I know there are certain words. Like, ooh, it just, ooh, it get me. Right? And because I know that, then I want to counter that. Holy Spirit, I know that. So help me to counter that so that I can avoid the trap of being ensnared and taken into bond. I don't want to fall back into the trap of that behavior that's in my flesh. So since I don't want to fall back into it, help me to counter my own habits, my own thought patterns, right? Because my thoughts are in a rut. Something happened, that same old thoughts, take that same old road, and it lead me to that same old place, which then causes me to engage in that same old pattern of behavior, right? Which is why I keep doing the same stuff over and over. But when I pay attention to the habit, I'm saying, Holy Spirit, help me to counter that because I don't want to be taken back into bondage and then get in a place where I'm beating myself up Oh, God, I did it again. I did it again. I know you don't want to hear me because I did it. I keep on making the same 
mistakes, God. I know you're going to turn your back on. I get caught up in bondage. Then I start flicking on those switches. Oh, I got to perform and earn my way back. Oh, I got anxiety because God don't want to be bothering me. No, I don't want to deal with that. So I work to counter it by saying, Holy Spirit, ooh, it's beautiful when you play a game and you can see where this is going. You're like, ooh, I see where this is going. We finna cut this off. Partner with the Holy Spirit to see where stuff is going so you can cut it off. So it helps us to avoid traps of the past, but it also helps us to avoid traps of rules and rituals and rites. Um, This is where, again, the pressure of other people and the subtle statements that are made that suggest you may not be Christian enough if. Well, I thought you really loved Jesus. Why you got to throw in really? <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's a subtle implication like you just pretending. You're not playing. Right? You're not serious. And because of that subtle implication, right, then then they're imposing their expectations, their standards, their rules, their rituals. You mean you don't do that? I thought, I thought you were a follower of Jesus, right? They're imposing their standards, their rituals upon us, and here's what we have to do. We have to say, you know what? I don't play that game. I don't play that game of I have to in order for God to be in relationship with me. Here's what I know. I have faith in Jesus Christ. I know I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I know I'm a child of God. I know I sin every day. I know that when I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to cleanse me and forgive me of all unrighteousness. That's what I know. I'm not playing these games. Well, you can't really love Jesus. You ain't been to church in two years. That has nothing to do with my relationship with Jesus. Now, we can have discussions about my understanding of community. But don't tell me that's got anything to do with my relationship with Jesus, right? My relationship with Jesus is totally different from my understanding of community. So let's separate it, and and it helps us to avoid those traps. To say, yeah, nope, I'm going to put some boundaries. I'm I'm not going there. I'm not playing that game. So avoid the traps of rites and rituals and rules, and then making sure that we understand that we're not called to fit into any label. We're called to follow Jesus. So let me make an aside uh, because of the culture we live in, and then I'll land this thing. Um, When we commit our lives to Jesus Christ, Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And Jesus proclaims, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world hear me, my kingdom is not of this country. You'll catch it when you get home. Why is it important to make that distinction? Because if we're not careful, people, as we prepare for an election, can suggest if you don't vote a certain way, you can't know Jesus. Wait, wait. Jesus has a kingdom agenda that is not like any other agenda of this world. There is no party that has the kingdom agenda. I know, it's all good. Send me your emails, all that. It's all good. Send it to me. I'll, I'll take it, right? Because the kingdom agenda is different from everything that man establishes, right? So so it's understanding that and not falling to the notion that I am somehow not Christian because of whatever whatever decision I make at a poll. It's just an aside, just an aside. So if you hear a statement like that, just say, you know what, boundaries, I need to put boundaries in. I'm a follower of Jesus. Jesus' ways are not the ways of this world. 
Jesus' kingdom is larger than any one country. Please hear me. Jesus has a kingdom that is not committed to one country over and above another one. Please hear me today. So that as we go into this season, I ain't going to fall out with you if that's what you believe. <laughs> Here's the decision I'm making. For freedom, Christ has set me free. I'm going to stand firm in it, and I will not allow myself to be dragged back into any kind of bondage. Right? Oh, let me just throw one more in for free because of, of where we live. And if you're new here, welcome to St. Paul. Um, let me throw one more in and then we'll, we'll land it. Jesus established his kingdom and followers and his establishment of his kingdom and setting us free for the kingdom to give glory to God is not tied to any particular church denomination. So don't, don't allow yourself to be ensnared, taken into bondage of if you're not this or that, you can't really love Jesus. You can't really be a child of Jesus if you're not this or that. If your church name is not this, if it's not that, you can't really be a child of God. Foolishness. <laughs> it's all good. Notice the hand claps get lighter and lighter, right? It's all good. I'll take it. Here's my point. Christ has set us free. Our relationship with the Father is through faith in Jesus. It's Jesus that has made it possible for us to be in relationship with the Father. So we make sure that we set up reminders, boundaries, habits to keep us in that place so that we don't allow ourselves because of pressure from people, because of pressure internally, because of anything else to be sucked into another more subtle form of bondage that is still bondage. So here is the call this morning. Many of you raised your hands to say, hey, I believe in Jesus. I place my faith, my hope in him. I'm a follower of Jesus. For freedom, Christ has set you free. Here is the call, the encouragement. Live free. Live free. This week, Make the choice to live free. This week, remind yourself, I'm free in Jesus. Freedom doesn't give me a license to sin. I want to walk in the Spirit. When I yield to the flesh, I want to turn back to the one who saved me and say thank you that it's in you and not in me. Help me now just to walk to please you. And when somebody say, hey, what you doing with that? And what you doing, like, talking to yourself? Like, I'm really trying to walk out my freedom. So that's all I want to encourage. Live free. Can you turn to somebody and say, live free? Turn to somebody else and say, live free. All right. So we're getting ready to go home, and we're getting ready to live free.